So I think it's really useful to watch those teaching videos because um, without the teaching videos, when you're just reading about the method, it can seem uh, a little bit abstract and, and you might not realize some of the things. So I, I was really glad when I found this teaching demonstration of the audiolingual method because since the audiolingual method has been criticized since the 1960s and is almost completely uh, scientifically dead since the 1970s, it's very rare that you can watch uh, any teacher using it today. Um, sometimes I know that some of my colleagues sometimes say things like this is, oh, um, a lot of people are using a behaviorist method, but when you realize how is actually the behaviorist method, you realize that this is not at all the same thing as what's happening in most classrooms today. If you're going to watch what, what happens in most Ecuadorians, but not just Ecuador, it's not, not even just Latin America. If you look at in the whole world, there are a lot of language classrooms where people where teachers are still using a very traditional approach but this is this is very very different from the from the 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 behaviorist approach and from the audiolingual methods so if you watched the teaching demonstration you could probably see that right maybe someone has any any kind of observation or any reaction about this video this teaching demonstration. Have you also had this impression that, oh, because I, I knew, of course, before I found this video, what the audio lingual method was like, but by seeing it uh, directly, it, it, it's really much clearer how, how it works and what are its, its limitations to. You, you, you see those, those extreme repetitions, right? The fact that the teacher makes the students repeat and repeat and repeat the sentence and then change and, and, it's, and it's this one same dialogue for a, a whole hour, a whole hour. It, it's really, really repetitive and redundant, but it's not uh, a lot of grammar. It's not a lot of explanations. It's only in the target language. It's a lot of speaking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, just one thing I want to say. Uh, one more thing I want to say about the behaviorist method, and that it's the fact that there is one thing I frequently hear that I think it's an error, and and it comes from the behaviorist method. You might have heard things like, uh, "Oh, we cannot teach." very well English here, or we cannot teach very well a language here because we have no language lab. Who has heard this kind of uh, observations about language laboratories, language labs? What do you think about this? I have something about this, uh, this situation. Yeah, you have heard that? And what do you think about the uh, language labs? Do you think it's something we need? I mean, I wouldn't say we don't need. I mean, it's useful. It's useful to reinforce the, the student understanding of the language. But that doesn't mean that if we don't have a lab, uh, we are not able to teach the language. I mean, we don't have many other materials, resources we can use to, to improve and uh, language skills Excellent. but um, many people say that yeah that we have we need the laboratory where they still need to be exposed to not only our voice but native speakers all the time i think that that is a misconception because uh, perhaps uh, you know as nowadays uh, the language is, doesn't belong anymore to uh, let's say north american people or british people yeah now it belongs to the world so it, it makes no difference is if we speak uh, you know in the way we speak as non-native speakers because if someone learns the language this person will be able to understand the way you speak or the way other people speak either native or non-native speakers yeah I, I so yes i agree the, about this we we really have to uh, relativize the importance of the native speaker 
And I think it's even more important regarding the language labs. So what I wanted to clarify is that the, the idea of the language lab really comes from the behaviorist perspective. It really comes from, let me see if I can find you a quick picture of this. Let me see if something, yes. Okay, so these are the language labs. When you're talking about language labs, that's typically this kind of situation that you find. A lot of students with head, he, earphones uh, and a short mic in front of a computer today. In the past, it would be something like this. Well, these are still computers actually. In the past, it would be even without a computer. In the, yeah, a long time ago, it would be something like that. You see, the key element of a language lab was the headphones, the mic, and some kind of system to be able to record and hear yourself and, and, and also hear instructions. So this concept of the language, you, you see it, it, it really, all these pictures, they're kind of the same. For example, here you don't have, do not have any uh, screen, I think. You only have some basic controls and then the, head, the headphones. So these were the language labs and I, I cannot see something a little bit older. Yeah, here is it. So this is probably what it looked like at the beginning of the behaviorist method, or even in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, that's what it looked like, okay, these language labs. Now, the language lab is really something that was created by the behaviorist perspective. One, one reason for that was the behaviorist wanted to be extremely scientific, okay, behaviorist was really extremely positivist, thinking that you can solve everything with pure theory and pure experiments. And um, because of this, they wanted to be extremely scientific, very extremely systematic, extremely experimental. And that's the reason why they call this the language lab. It's not really a laboratory where you're doing experiments, but that's the closest they could find that would be scientific. And so that's the reason why it was like this. It, what, what would you do in the language lab? You would put the headphones on, you would hear sentences and just have to repeat those sentences. Eventually be uh, recorded or you, the teacher could hear what you were saying uh, just to correct you eventually. Um, sometimes you might need be able to hear yourself to see if it was correct or not, even though I'm not sure you were able to judge that yourself, but um, that was the language lab. Hearing, repeating, hearing, repeating. That was extremely repetitive. Now, what we could call today a language lab, if we talking about something like this, can, can you see my screen actually? Yes, right? You can see this, the pictures I'm showing, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so if you're looking at something like this, now, if it's just a, a, a place in the, the, the university or the school where you have computers and you can use those computers to do a lot of different activities, well, that's fine. That's not really a language lab anymore. That's kind of a computer room. You can use it for so many different things. It's not really a language lab. Do, you, do we need a language lab? I don't think we do need one at all. Do we need a computer room? That might be useful, even though but that's something we'll talk at the end of this semester. But even though currently, rather than complaining about the fact that the school doesn't have any uh, enough computers, or sometimes the schools do have computers, but those are very old computers, or you don't have the applications that you want on the computers. Currently, if you are working with teenagers, especially uh, bachillerato or adults at the university, etc., I would rely much more on the devices of the of the students such as their mobile phone rather than trying to use a computer room which is a burden most of the time but that's that's a different discussion but just so what i wanted to say here is that the the, the concept of a language lab that was extremely linked to the behaviorist approach another thing that is extremely linked to the behaviorist approach is all the contrastive linguistics approach so you know that in our uh, department, there are um, very intense contrastive linguistics 
uh, classes. This is not the case in all universities and all countries in the world. Actually, most universities are, are, are most universities are giving much less space to contrastive linguistics. Contrastive linguistics was extremely important in the 1970s, in the 1960s, because in this behaviorist approach, the idea was that we had to find the wrong influences of the native language and correct those as soon as possible. And so this idea of the contrastive linguistics was, it was extremely important. Nowadays, in a communicative approach and, and, and all the things we know currently about language teaching, li contrastive linguistics has, has lost a lot of its importance. But yeah, that's just a detail. It's, what I want to say is that some of these concepts, like language lab, etc., are really connected to a certain tradition. OK, let's go back to the second topic of today. Where is it? Here it is. So you have been able to see the video, or maybe any other question about the behaviorist approach, or the behaviorist perspective, or, or the audio lingual method? I hope it's clear. So let's go to the other topic of today. Um, so as I was saying in my message, I had initially planned two different videos, one on the behaviorist perspective, the other one on the innatist perspective, which is a kind of the, the reaction to the behaviorist perspective. So it's kind of opposite to it. Um, the problem is these videos, they take a lot of time to prepare and I couldn't do it on time. So I'm going to explain you today the, the, the innatist, innatist perspective here. So as I was saying, the behaviorist perspective really dominant in the 1950s and in the 1960s. During the 1960s, you started to have very strong critics of the behaviorist perspective for all the reasons I said that it didn't really work and people were learning a lot of these extreme uh, extremely uh, absurd sentences, you may have heard others. I, I mentioned in the videos, I mentioned John is in the kitchen and your flowers are beautiful. Have you heard other sentences like that that people remember because they always learned those and repeated those in school, but they don't really ever use those? Do you know of other sentences like that? No, you might have been uh, spared or your, your parents might have been spared from those, uh, those, those extremely repetitive sentences. Now, I'm not talking about sentences that sometimes people are using a lot in, 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 the, in the classroom, but that do make sense. Things like, uh, what does this mean? Or, uh, excuse me, sir, can I go to the bathroom? Or that kind of thing. Because even though it's kind of, also, you learn it as a sentence and you learn it like this. Well, this is something you can actually use in the classroom. But John is in the kitchen. Not sure you will ever that use that in your life. You really have to have a friend named John that him has to, he's a, he has to be in the kitchen. There has to be someone who asks you at that precise moment where John is. So it, it really tends to be extremely limited. And that's the problem of the behaviorist approach. Now, as I was saying in the video, the biggest critic of the behaviorist approach or the behaviorist perspective was Noam Chomsky. So you know Noam Chomsky uh, for his theory of linguistics. And actually his main claim is also called the innatist claim. And it's the idea that uh, we have an innate capacity to learn the language. So we do not learn the language just because we are exposed to it. We also have in ourselves, probably somewhere in the brain, a device, a capacity. That's what uh, Chomsky calls the learning acquisition device. Uh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm wrong here. It's not learning acquisition device. It's language acquisition device. Sorry about that. Uh, so language acquisition device that allows you to pick up the language you're exposed to as a child and also pick up new languages later on or even as a child if you're learning two languages at the same time. So what Chomsky says is that the capacity that we have 
to learn a language as a baby cannot be explained only by what the baby is able to hear. That's called the, uh, the, the oh, I, I don't remember the name now, but that's the idea that, uh, I, uh, the name is something with stimulus. <laughs> and, and just let me check that. I was not, poverty of stimulus. Yeah, that's it, sorry about, uh, I was not going to talk about it, but you remember that in the behaviorist perspective, you have the idea of stimulus response, right? And what Chomsky says is that it's not possible to learn a language just from the stimulus that the child hears, because the children only hear certain sentences and there are certain sentences that, that they've never heard, but they are yet able to, still able to create those new, new sentences. So what Chomsky says is that considering the poverty of the stimulus, it's not possible to explain all we, we are able to do with the language just with what we are exposed to. It has to also be some kind of capacity, some kind of universal grammar. That's the term that Chomsky uses. We have some kind of universal grammar inside our brain that allows us to create new sentences. And, and, and an exa the example that Chomsky always uses is the famous uh, sentence, um, those green IDs sleep furiously. So all this sentence is completely impossible and meaningless. IDs cannot be green, IDs cannot sleep, and it's impossible to sleep furiously. But even then, you hear this sentence, green IDs sleep furiously, and it works grammatically. You can feel in your, in your brain that this sentence is not grammatically incorrect. If I would say something like, dog Juan plays never, you see that this sentence does not work, even though the meaningful, the, the, the meaning can work, but you see that this sentence grammatically is incorrect. The other one is impossible, which means never you, you have never heard of this sentence in your life, and yet you can see that this sentence is grammatically correct. So that's the, that, that's the idea of Chomsky, that we have an innate capacity to learn the language, whether it's the L1, the native language, or whether it's an L2, a second or foreign language, okay? And so the claim of the innate perspective is that learning the second language is the same or very similar and should be very similar to learning the first language, okay? This is kind of, this is kind of uh, intuitive. I would say that most of us might agree with that. Do you agree with that or do you think it's, it's wrong? What's your opinion about that? Does somebody have an opinion about this? Do you think we learn a second language the same way we learn our first language? I would say so. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, if we, you pay attention to the way we are start learning, I mean, that would, should be the way we should, we should learn the language, but it's not actually how it happens in Maybe. language institutions. Yeah, because I, when the child starts learning a language, you know that they learn through repetition. They first uh, understand the language and then they produce it. But when we go, or most of us go to language institutions, they immediately try to fill us with uh, grammar rules without even knowing how the language works. Yeah, so that's the biggest problem. And uh, the correct way to learn language would be, or should be, um, as a um, um, children learned first they hear then repeat they hear they repeat and later on they will be able to create their own uh, senses their own ideas mm -hmm. yeah there are multiple things in what you're saying and, and what we know about how we how children learn the language that we have to remember here first indeed th there are multiple aspects of it first the fact that it's first oral okay children do not start to read or write before they are five six years old uh, so that's a very important distinction. We should maybe start first with oral. 
Note that this, in this aspect, it's still the same as the behaviorist perspective. Very different from the grammar translation, but still the same as behaviorism. Second thing, children, yeah, they, first they hear and then they produce. This is something we can discuss because actually sometimes for certain aspects, so for example, sometimes um, it's easier for children to start learn to write before they actually start to learn how to, uh, to read. Sometimes, I'm not saying that it's uh, always like that, but if you have a young child or a nephew or a niece or a friend's uh, young child, child, five or four years old, he might actually be able to write sentence, uh, write letters before he starts reading and, and it can help them uh, learn but so I'm, I'm not what I mean here is that it's not strictly always first hear and then um, first receive and then produce but even then there are some aspects of it that that do work okay you always need to hear first something before you can uh, repeat it or something um, and also different aspects such as the fact that there sorry there is no grammar in child learning so you have never seen a parent in front of a one-year-old baby saying, mm -hmm, now I will explain to you the, the, the simple present and the, the present perfect, because you should not com confuse, co uh, confuse the simple present or the simple past with the present perfect. No, it's not necessary to do that. They never actually learn the grammar before getting to writing. And the only moment in your own learning of your own language where you might need some grammar is exclusively for writing. You do not need the grammar to be able to speak. And not only that, it's also, it's interesting that all of you have normally right now an ability to speak in English. You are all able to speak more or less spontaneously. If I ask you a question, you can answer immediately. When you're answering to this, you're not talking, you're not thinking in terms of grammar. You're not uh, first putting words into sentences by thinking about what is the rule that I have to use right now to create this, this sentence. No, you're immediately thinking in the language. All right. Now, a very important uh, theory of the innateist perspective is the monitor model designed or developed by Stephen Krashen. So if you watch the video of James Brown about the natural approach of learning a language, how he says that we have to acquire a language and not learn it. In this video, you have seen Stephen Krashen. So he, inter he, he participates in this video. He's quite old now, he's retired mostly, uh, but he um, he's still alive and still well. And so Stephen Krashen is probably one of the most influential researchers on language acquisition. He's also somewhat controversial because sometimes his ideas are, he's, he's kind of stubborn. <laughs> but so his monitor model is really interesting. And, and the monitor model is a whole model of language acquisition with five hypotheses that are the key of the monitor model. Some of them are more, more interesting than others. So the first, um, the first theory, the first hy hypothesis is the acquisition learning theory. And that is the first thing that uh, James Brown explained in his, in his video is that ex acquisition is not the same as learning. Acquisition is implicit, learning is explicit. So when you learn a language like a baby does, you acquire it, when you study it, you study the grammar, you study the vocabulary, then you learn it. Now, uh, this is an interesting difference, but let me be clear that currently most specialists do not use this distinction anymore. So if you read uh, most books and articles about second language acquisition, etc., do not think that every time they're using acquisition, it, it means uh, implicit and learning it means explicit. It's people do not really care that much about that. I think 
it doesn't really make so, such a difference. The thing is that it's not like two different things that have nothing in common. It's more like a continuum. There, there, is a lear there is implicit learning and there is explicit learning, but it's not like you can always distinguish the two as two completely different processes that have nothing to do with each other. Sometimes, for example, you can learn something explicitly, so you might study the grammar, and then by practicing it, practicing it, and practicing it, it can become implicit, and you might not need to think about the grammar anymore to be able to use this rule adequately just by practice. So practice can transform an implicit knowledge into an, an explicit knowledge into an implicit knowledge, for example. And that's called automatization. But so this difference between acquisition and learning, not so important today, but it's important to understand their thinking and their use of the vocabulary. A very interesting hypothesis is the monitor hypothesis. So what does it says this monitor hypothesis? It says that, that the grammar, we do not use it to produce the sentences. We use it to monitor the sentences that the, learn, ah, that the language acquisition device produce. So what Krashen says is that when you're, what you use the grammar for is not to put, into, put words into sentences to create a new sentence, to create a new message. It's rather that you, um, you, you have a learning device which is the one that creates the sentences from what you have heard, what you, what you have read. So you have seen different sentences, you, you reuse them, you recreate a new sentence. And then what you use the grammar for and the learn system, you use it to control if the sentence that you have created is correct. So this is really important. The idea that the grammar is not useful to create the new sentences, but used to correct the sentences or to check the sentences or to, to monitor the sentences, whether they are correct or not, and possibly fix them. That's the use of grammar according to Krashen. There is also the natural order hypothesis. I will not insist a lot on this one. So the idea of the natural order is that we learn concepts and, and structures in a certain order that will always be the same and that is a natural order. Now, it is partly true, but I don't think it makes such a big difference for certain things. So it is true that, for example, you will always learn the simple present before the past and the future, okay? We always need first to express things about the present before we can express things about the past and the future. But then do you need to learn first the simple past or the future, uh, the will going to? Do you need to use to learn first will or do you need to first learn going to? Well, it depends. And there's, it depends on what you need to express. So for example, the, the difference between will and going to, uh, typically if you're talking about your plan, uh, your, your plans for the weekend, you're probably, and if you're talking, you're probably going to use going to, and so that's what you will need first. If you want first to talk about the future, like what will happen in five years or what will happen for the world, then you probably need will first. So there is, there is certain things that come before, but then after that, you still have a lot of flexibility, I believe. And so the natural order hypothesis, I don't think it makes such a big difference. Is this clear until now? Yes. Okay. Do not hesitate to interrupt me if something is not clear or if you have any question or, or idea about this. Now, the comprehensible input hypothesis is probably the most important idea of Stephen Krashen. And it's also a dominant idea and probably the most agreed upon idea. So, I think that everyone in the research community agrees with the general idea of the comprehensible input hypothesis, which says that to acquire language, you need input. That means exposure. That means hearing or listening or, or uh, reading the language, seeing the language in use. That's input that you receive. 
but this has to be comprehensible. So if you do not understand what you're reading, what you're listening to, you will not be able to acquire it, to learn it. If you do understand it, then you will be able to acquire new structures and new vocabulary, et cetera. Um, I always take this example. So for example, let's, let, if I would take one of you, uh, let's uh, take uh, Christian. I will take Christian and I will put him in Japan. Suddenly, like no preparation whatsoever. Up, oh, you're in Japan now. Or if you know something about Japanese, something, uh, let's go to uh, Malaysia or something like that. And you're you're in this country where you do not know anything anything about the language. What do you think uh, Christian will be able to learn? Do you think if I leave him there for two months, do you think he will be able to learn some of it or not? What do you think? Emily, maybe. Um, maybe she... Uh, sorry, he can learn the language because he is exposed uh, with the language. I mean, he can read and listening and he had to he has to speak in that language. Okay, that's that's a very relevant uh, observation. So on one side, he is exposed to the language and he's forced to use it. He probably doesn't know anybody from Ecuador or from South America in this context, so he has to use Japanese or Malaysian. Uh, but then there is this problem that it has to be comprehensible. So who could say the other side of this? What's the risk here? I think that even if he's exposed, you know, in an environment where he's going to be exposed to the language, if he doesn't know anything previously, it's going to be really difficult for him to get new words or to get patterns. So in, in order to be able to, you know, develop uh, your target language, I think that uh, first of all, you need to know or to have some previous knowledge about it. And that is what the comprehensible input is about. Yeah, in, in, yeah, almost. Uh, but it depends on what you mean by previous knowledge. But if by previous knowledge you mean grammar or some, some formal studying of it, no, but if you no. want to, but yeah, but if it's something you need to be able to understand it, yes. So what happens here? Actually, if Christian is put, and you might actually have had this experience yourself, or you might have seen that. If I, you turn on the TV and you end up on a Chinese channel, don't know if there is any possibility of doing that in, in Ecuador, but you end up in a Chinese channel, 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 yeah. Um, you will not understand anything. Will you be able to learn words? I'm not sure. Maybe, but it will really, really be extremely complicated. Or if suddenly uh, you are in a restaurant and the five people around you speak a completely other language. I don't know, French. And you don't know anything about French. And they start speaking with each other. Uh, you, you will probably not understand anything. And you will probably not be able to pick up any words or any structures of it. Now, so that might say, okay, so Christian is never going to learn the Japanese language and he's going to starve then in Japan because he's not even be going to be able to, to buy a bread. Now, the good thing about that is that actually, if you go there, what happens is you're not always facing people talking to each other in a language they perfectly understand. People will realize that you don't understand the language. They will start to use gestures and they will say things like, uh, they will start to speak really slowly, simplify the sentences, use basic vocabulary, maybe use just words like uh, pain, uh, do you want bread? Hmm? Bread or, or uh, and, and, and you say yes or no or hi in, 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 uh, in Japanese. And you will quickly start to learn when 
people adapt their language so that it makes it becomes comprehensible with the context with the gesture with the simplification etc you can actually understand some of it so that's the key here to acquire a language you need a lot of input but it has to be comprehensible this is extremely close so um, sorry before that uh, Krushen calls this also i plus one i is your current level of understanding plus one means that you can have new I, new elements in it but it does it doesn't have to be i plus 10 it's just i plus just a little bit above and it's very close to the concept of um, the zone of proximal development of vygotsky you probably have heard about that so the zone of proximal development it means this is the zone of what you can already do yourself on your own so for example if you're starting to learn a new language maybe you can say hello maybe you can say your name maybe you can ask a basic question like what's your name or how old are you and then just after it there is the zone of what you can do with help and that's the zone of proximal development so that's something you cannot do completely on your own yet but it's sufficiently close to what you already can do so that you actually are able to to learn it so it means that as long as you have something here you can already do something and or, or what you are trying to do is close to what you already can do you are able to learn it and then there is outside that the zone of the things you cannot yet do you can do that even with help because it's too far away from what you're currently able to do. So for example, if you are able to ask a basic question, maybe you can learn to ask a, a slightly more advanced question. Or if you're able to speak about yourself, maybe the next step is talking about your past, a very simple thing about what you've done last weekend. But it's very far from being able to express your opinion about the death about death and life and, and the, the purpose of life or something like that. That's not something you would be able to do yet. Okay, so that's the idea of I plus one, comprehensible input. Is it clear? Yes, bro. All right. And so the last, um, the last idea of, sorry remove that the last uh, hypothesis of Stephen Krushen is the affective filter hypothesis now the affective filter hypothesis is rather intuitive as well is the idea that there might be emotions attitudes uh, affections that influence or learning of the language especially that can block or, or learning of the language for example, the case of anxiety. So the idea of, of Krushen is that normally if you receive comprehensible input, you will learn from it. But if you're really anxious about the learning process, you might not be able to learn because of this anxiety. So for example, let's again take the example of Christian in Japan. Maybe the person will adapt to him and will try to talk to him in very basic sense, very, very basic words. But if at that moment Christian is so afraid that he refuses to even try, then he will basically block mentally his ears and he will not be able to understand anything and not acquire anything. That's the idea that anxiety can hinder the learning of the, single, the foreign language. It's quite, uh, and, and on the opposite side, of course, motivation is, is a positive filter and helps you acquire more of the language. Now, uh, just let me, normally I had a graph here, but it, it never works, I'm not sure why. So let me just show you a graph of this monitor model. Um, and it's here. Let me see if I can have it. Yeah. So that's 
that's the monitor model of Stephen Krashen, a, uh, visually represented. You have comprehensible input. That's the starting point of everything. By receiving comprehensible input, as long as it's, as it's not blocked by the affective filter, it, it is picked up by the language acquisition device and it's transformed into acquire knowledge. So that's what, from comprehensible input, you, you, you build up your current knowledge of the language. This acquired knowledge is really what helps you produce new sentences the output. So it's from all the words, all the sentences, all the fragments that you already know that you will be able to produce. And what you have learned, such as the grammar, you use it to monitor both the process of transforming your knowledge into output and checking your output itself. Okay, so that's where you check if what you have created is correct and if the process of creating it is valid. That's the idea of uh, the monitor model and the input hypothesis of Krashen. Now, to be extremely precise, the very specificity of Krashen is that about the comprehensible input hypothesis, he's not only saying that we need comprehensible input, he's saying that's the only thing that we need to acquire the language. And that's also what you heard in the video by James Brown. The only thing that he needs is to acquire the knowledge, uh, to, to, to have comprehensible input. And that's the moment where some people disagree with Krashen, because most researchers today also think that it's not only input that you need, you also need practice, and you also need output, and you also need interaction, discussion with other people to be able to practice and develop your language. But that's a different subject for next week. So that's mo the crash and monitor model. I hope it's clear. And now, now let me, and I'm sorry it's taking a little bit long, but afterwards you will be more active. Let me concretely go towards what does it mean in terms of language teaching methods. So we have three main innatist methods. The first one is a really old one, is the direct method. Who has heard about the direct method? You might have heard about it in your Didactica General course, right? I think that it was just uh, to expose the, the learner to the language that it, this person is trying to learn, but without this idea in mind of comprehensive input. It was just like to expose the person to, to the language. And yeah. that's pretty much it. Yes, in a way, yes, that's, that's correct. So um, the direct method was created in the 1920s, uh, also in reaction to the grammar translation method. So in the grammar translation method, as I told you, already started in the 19th century. And by the, the First World War, people already started to realize that it was not working. And so they tried something completely different from the same ideas of the innatist method, the, the innatist perspective saying, okay, this grammar translation is not working. Let's try to do it as we learn the, our own language. Now, the ideas behind it were great. And of course, oh, sorry, let me be very clear that of course Chomsky and Krashen and all these ideas of the innatist perspective were not yet uh, born in the 1920s. But the same ideas are behind the direct method. So the direct method, generally the ideas were great. Um, I think most of us would agree with the general idea that you have to be exposed to the language. You have to, for, for example, it was also the idea that you have to focus on speech, not focus on writing. Uh, you have to use the environment to learn the, the different words. So the teacher would say things like, oh, this is a book. This is a book, etc." And and all this was, was, was good. The problem is that it was extremely difficult to apply to institutionalize language teaching. And it failed miserably. And that's why it says here 1920s and not a, a range of years because it lasted for, I don't know, four years. And after four years, everyone was saying, no, it doesn't work. 
Now, it's not that the ideas were not working. The problem is that the teacher did not know how to do that concretely because the ideas were generally nice. It worked nice, but it didn't work well to organize the learning in a classroom. The teacher did not know exactly what to do. So they would start, yes, at the beginning for, uh, hello, my name is, uh, and then this is a book. Repeat, this is a book. Is this a book? Yes, this is a book. Great. Uh, this is the blackboard. What is this? It is the blackboard. Oh yeah, great. Is this the blackboard? Yes, it is the blackboard. But okay, that would be nice for one hour, two hours, maybe five hours. But after that, what do you do? And so they didn't really know how to manage this, this whole learning process because they, they first many teachers had actually a very low proficiency in the language. So they were not able to speak that very easily. Uh, they had no idea of concrete instructions. There, are no, there were no textbooks yet or very basic ones. They didn't know what to teach. They, they also had this idea of, okay, let's teach vocabulary. But okay, you teach a lot of vocabulary. This is the book, this is the blackboard, this is the lamp, this is the, uh, yeah, a lot more books. <laughs> um, but where do, after that, what do you do? So a lot of vocabulary is nice, but you don't really get anywhere closer to a communicative ability from knowing just vocabulary. You also need to be able to use it in certain situations. And so the direct method didn't really work. The good ideas, didn't work, okay? The second uh, innatist approach is the natural approach. The, this is the natural approach created by Krashen himself uh, with Terrell in 1983. Now, um, concretely, this natural approach, what does it, uh, it's, it's it, again, a lot of good ideas, but sometimes it does not work in the classroom. Um, it's not really clear for a teacher with, in front of a large classroom how to do and manage all this because comprehensible input is great. Okay, we agree on this. Everyone agrees on this. But so what do you do? You show your students a lot of movies, movies and another movie and you make them read and, and then what? And what if they don't understand immediately? How do you find enough input that is actually comprehensible? So it's not always easy to practice in front of a class either. It, it works typically very well for one-on-one -on -one learning, especially for a motivated learner. So that's the reason why the video you saw with James Brown learning Arabic by himself and receiving a lot of input, that works great. Why? Because he is doing it one-on-one -on -one in front of a tutor. And that's much more, e much easier than doing it in front of a class or as a student in, in a class of 30. So the natural approach, great ideas, but again, a little bit difficult to apply, especially in front of a class. Now, the third method is someone, something we are going to talk about a little bit more in the next, next week, but it's the total physical response. So in very briefly, the total physical response is the idea that at the first uh, stage of learning with real beginners, we shouldn't do anything written, anything, uh, anything written, it's only oral, but also not only is it only oral, we are only going to ask the students to react without saying anything. A little bit like what William was saying at the beginning that a baby at the first, he just listens and then he will start to speak after one year. But for one year, he's not speaking. He's just listening. So based on this, the total physical response says, okay, what we are going to do is the, the teacher is going to talk in the language, is going to give instructions and the students are going to react mostly with gestures and movements. A little bit like a kind of extremely long Simon Says. You know the Simon Says like, uh, raise your first, your left hands or Simon Says, raise your left hand. And so well, that's the other one. <laughs> For you, it's this one. But um, so that that's what the teacher would do. But actually, when you do that, it's a, it, it's already you. You might say, but okay, it's we. I can do that for fifteen minutes. But after that, but actually, you can do very a lot of 
interesting things with that. And it goes beyond the basic vocabulary of the direct method because you can say things like, okay, raise your hand, put your hand on your, on your head. But you can also open your book uh, and then uh, run. And, and of course you do not run, you just imitate the fact of running or uh, uh, drink and, and you just do this, etc. So you can do a lot of different actions and it's quite interesting as a third activity for uh, beginners. Uh, the, the method itself is probably not self-sufficient. It's probably not enough, but the ideas are great, especially with beginners, and it works quite well in front of a classroom. Of course, you will have your students in, uh, get up and they have to move a lot, etc. But it, it's quite an interesting thing. I will show you uh, videos uh, for next week. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so let me finish with just the limitations. Well, all this seems great, but so we all agree, I think all of us agree globally, generally, on the ideas of the Initis method. Nobody is, is going to say here, no, 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 uh, we don't need input, we don't need exposure, we just need grammar. No, uh, I, we're, we, I think we all agree about the general principles of it. The limitations are mostly that certain claims of the innateist perspective are too extreme. For example, when Krashen says that grammar is useless, we don't need grammar at all. Well, actually grammar can be useful. It's not that we need grammar to be able to speak, but grammar can make it sometimes faster to learn some things. Uh, and, and that's the idea of some explicit teach, teaching can actually speed the learning up. And here, let me just give you a small uh, mathematical explanation of this. We always say, oh, child children, they, they are so good to, at learning languages. But yeah, what we do not really consider is the number of hours they spend doing that. So if you think that a child is, around, is um, awake around eight hours per day times 365 days per year. That gives you, let me take my calculator, eight times 365 gives you 2,900, uh, 2,920 hours. That's the number of hours a child is exposed to the language, maybe less, maybe a little bit less than eight hours, but even if it's four, it's still like, one 1,500 years hours per, per year. And a child, he takes one year before he starts speaking. And even then it's just words. And then one or two more years before he is actually able to use the language relatively efficiently, not even be able to do a, a speech in front of a crowd, but yeah, able to use sentences. So three years of that. And so you take this 200, uh, 2,920 times three, and you get 8,760 hours in three years. So almost 9,000 hours to be able to just use the language in a basic form. Compare this with how many hours most of our learners have in school. At best, they have, what, 150, maybe 200 hours per year, maybe a little bit more, but they never even reach 1,000 hours, 1,000. So when we say that children learn very efficiently, yes. Do they learn really fast? I don't think so. So the advantage of this is that the grammar and the explicit teaching can think can speed things up. We can actually go faster because we teach the rules without having to be exposed to a huge number of examples before understanding the rule. So that's why explicit teaching can be useful. All right. And the last point is that as I was saying, especially in front of a class, when you need to 
teach the language to a group of 20, 30, 40, 50 students, some procedures need to be more structured. And especially the direct method and the natural approach tend to fail a little bit on this aspect. And that's why I don't think, I, I really think the principles are great, but the techniques themselves are not really useful for us anymore. There are other things that we can do. I think the techniques of the TPR, the total physical response are, are interesting and can be applied. The, tech, the ideas of the direct method, the method themselves of natural approach and, and, and direct method are not really useful, all right? So that's a summary of the innate perspective. Sorry, I've been a little bit longer than when I wanted. Now we are going to take a break.